recruiting universities, you're still selecting people who will benefit um, and uh, benefit from a life uh, transforming experience of, of higher education. And that is different from fulfilling a set of criteria, do I live in the right uh, postcode or whatever. It is very different. It's more like recruitment for a job. You know, none of us here would, uh, you know, if we apply for a job, you, you, it's absolutely expected that you meet the minimum requirements, that, you know, on the uh, uh, specified in the recruitment, and then you are selected, and you're selected through um, all sorts of other means. Um, I would really um, encourage you to have a look at um, something like PwC, who have a very, very competitive um, uh, undergraduate internship program. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you go on their website, they manage to tell you in a non-patronising and a non-dumbing down way exactly how they're going to assess you in a very competitive selection process but they tell you exactly what they're looking like looking for and they tell you how they're going to do that selection and when it comes to interviews and group tests they have videos that don't just show you the kind of introductory bit of an interview they show you the whole session and then they show you the assessors talking about what they've seen and how they're going to assess it and that to me that is the kind of standard that we need to start reaching for in higher education, if we're at least to have a chance, you know, going back to my killer slide, um, uh, you know, there may be some other reasons why that slide is like that, but um, something also about uh, people from uh, backgrounds where they don't have the kind of social context and the support to, to um, for these additional elements, the personal statement, uh, the reference, and uh, the interview. <coughs> How am I doing for time? I need to wrap up. Don't I? I just wanted to say a couple of things about autonomy. Um, so the white paper, um, <clears throat> which was called uh, Students at the Heart of the System, um, uh, said that they would ensure HEFKE, that's the funding council in England, uh, would sit within a framework of arm's length principles, precluding it from any role in admissions, protecting institutional autonomy, and ensuring academic freedom is not uh, compromised. And I, it's been impressed on me right from the start of my um, uh, post at UCAS that admissions is one of the three pillars of autonomy um, in higher education. Nobody's ever told me yet what the other two are, but um, I do know that admissions um, is one of them. Um, and I think there are some significant uh, threats to institutional autonomy. One is I don't really understand... <coughs> how you can widen participation with capped numbers and nobody's saying who should lose out. So if we're successful in widening participation, who is it who, who loses out? And of course, um, the, the, the middle classes and those who've paid for the children's <coughs> education are really worried that the, the target is, is on them. And actually, I, I don't blame them. Um, but I, you know, I think this is a really important question. You widen participation, who loses out? Because if the numbers are capped, there's nowhere uh, to go. Um, and then uh, the next one is this sort of idea of some kind of quotas. So this is all around um, the Office of Fair Access um, and the access agreements that institutions have to write. Um, and it's something about um, targets or quotas uh, for enrolments from um, applicants from more deprived uh, backgrounds. <clears throat> and this, um, the way that uh, these quotas or, or targets are set is to do with contextual backgrounds. So that list I put up for, from the website, you know, it's about whether you, the school performance is poor or you, the post, you know, you're on a postcode where there's low participation in HE. There's a whole load of what's called contextual data um, around each applicant. But of course, the contextual data that's available, and UCAS does do a contextual data service for admissions folk, <clears throat> the data is very, very poor. And anyway, um, you know, if free school meals is one of the measures that might put you into the right category for quotas or targets, um, is that free school meals for, you know, for one term? or for one year, or for all of your education. Nobody's really uh, pinned this down. And actually, there was a very interesting letter <coughs> um, from the High Master um, of Manchester Grammar School. Um, and he, I thought he put this quite well. You know, who, who counts in all of this? 
student from a financially disadvantaged background, uh, living in you know all the right indicators, but um, uh, receiving a bursary <coughs> um, to go to a selective independent school, or a comprehensive school uh, student with with uh, well-off professional parents living by choice in um, a low participation uh, neighbourhood, or one similarly rich, non-professional parents um, who are paying for private tuition to make up for the fact that the school has very um, poor uh, performance. Um, or a student from a middle-income family at an aspirational academy with a poor track record now uh, getting support from a partnership with an independent school. So uh, you can see that's kind of written through a certain lens, but actually I think it makes the point quite well. Nobody's actually um, said what all of this means, and I think it's um, uh, very, very difficult uh, to tie down, and there will continue to be um, challenges around it. Um, other threats, I think, um, to institutional <coughs> autonomy are what I call sort of Russell-centric uh, policy. Um, and, you know, the Russell Group is undoubtedly very uh, taxed by, you know, those who um, threaten <coughs> and, and moan about their intake of people from more deprived backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds and so on. Um, indeed, uh, Les Ebden was uh, quoted, um, perhaps unfortunately, as threatening the nuclear option. Um, but the government definition of a good university is, you know, is Russell Group, and Russell Group is the goal, and that's the kind of lens that they... Um, that they see everything through. Um, and I don't think this is terribly surprising. I kind of looked up, the ca this is the cabinet. <laughs> perhaps you already know this. 30, out of 30 of them, 20 of them went to Oxford <coughs> or Cambridge. Um, and so I, at, one, at some stage I must do their um, education background. I suspect uh, many of those would have come from um, independent schools. There's only three here who didn't go to Russell Group University. So Ian Duncan Smith, who has an unspecified military background, uh, Patrick McLaughlin, who I don't even know what sort of minister he is, I don't know if anyone does, uh, who went to the Staffordshire College of Agriculture, and Eric Pickles, who went to Leeds uh, Polytechnic. Uh, you know, so is it any wonder, and you look at the dates that they were all at, at, at university, you know, is it any wonder that these folk see higher education through a lens which is probably about 20 or 30 years out of date? Um, and so my final threat is uh, this dereg. This is England only, uh, so apologies if there are people from the other countries of the UK, but the deregulation of number controls for those who've got AAB grades or higher or the equivalent of those. <clears throat> We've seen from the data I've showed you that widening participation is happening from the bottom uh, up, but the deregulation is happening at the top. And actually, that deregulation is paid for by cutting the numbers for those uh, below AAB um, and an emphasis on those who are providing um, at lower fee levels. Um, and I've got some real worries about this policy, um, which I call kind of putting the Treasury at the heart of the system, not putting the student at the heart of the system, because actually there's a cliff edge and it'll, it'll be the same next year if they change you know, AAB to ABB or something. But those who fall just below, particularly if they've been predicted AAB and they miss their grades, in any other year they'd have probably got a near-miss offer. And actually loads of institutions which have done fantastic work in making contextual offers um, to those with, with more difficult backgrounds um, will be put in a position where they're having to do not just one number control, but two sets of number controls, those who have AAB and better, and those who have uh, fall below the threshold. Um, and in my view, you know, admission by, uh, by quota is not uh, the right way to go. <clears throat> so very quickly, I'm sorry I've overrun, um, uh, conclusions. So um, no doubt in my mind that secondary education um, you know, does hold probably the biggest key uh, to widening participation in higher education. Um, it has to, you know, achievement has to be a prerequisite uh, for progression. Um, achievement is lagging behind for more deprived, uh, those from more deprived backgrounds, but it is catching up as well as, as I think we've seen from the data. 
Um, no doubt in my mind that admissions policy is a very, very complex area and it is absolutely ripe for unintended consequences.